Hi, everybody. This is Taylor Young with Durham's Partnership for Children. I hope you are all doing well today as you're watching this webinar. Um, this will be a brief video that goes over the 21-22 interim COVID-19 policies for NC pre-K programs. Uh, so I will be providing just some additional guidance and clarity um, regarding the updates that DCDEE has provided in the document with this same title, the 2021-2022 Interim COVID-19 Policies for NC Pre-K Programs. So here is a brief overview of what I will be reviewing from this document. Now, this is not comprehensive of everything that is included in the DCDEE document. So I highly recommend that you access the PDF, the, the um, presentation slides for this webinar and access the, the document itself by clicking down here. That way you can review all of the policies in their entirety. Um, as I mentioned, this will not be comprehensive. I'm going to just touch the highlights of what is the most important for you as teachers. All right, so first question, does this apply to me? If you are watching this video, yes, it does. So the guidance in the DCDEE document, as well as in this presentation, applies to all NC pre-K classrooms, regardless of where they operate. So this would be private child care centers, if you are a DPS, NC pre-K teacher, or Head Start. That means that this applies to you as well. Mode of classroom instruction. So if, hopefully you will all be happy to hear that um, the goal for 21-22 is to provide as much stability and in-person instruction as possible for children and families. So the expectation of DCDEE is that all NC pre-K students will be provided fully in-person instruction for the 21-22 um, program year. And as of right now, um, NC pre-K programs will not be allowed to operate fully remote or fully hybrid for the school year. Of course, just note that all of the guidance in this document is, of course, subject to change as updated COVID information becomes available and as things progress. As we've learned over the past year and a half, things do um, progress rather quickly. So as updated information comes out, DCDEE will continue to update this guidance, and we, of course, will be sure to share those updates with you all. However, with the expectation, <clears throat> excuse me, that classrooms are operating fully in person, there are circumstances where remote learning may be needed. DCDEE has outlined these four circumstances under which remote learning would be needed. Um, again, these are circumstances under which remote learning can be provided to children for a limited time. Um, this is not again, to be, um, uh, you know, classrooms will not operate fully remote or fully hybrid for this year. So the four circumstances are, as you see on the screen, during the weeks prior to instruction, starting on September, September 7th. Um, so of course, our start date is a little bit sooner than this. So this would be um, for your home visits. If you do a welcome and orientation, what have you, that, that can be virtual. Um, second, if a COVID cluster, so five or more cases occurs, and the local health department recommends that the site or classroom closes. The third situation would be if a child is not able to attend because the child and or a household member is sick and quarantined due to COVID. Or the last circumstance would be if DHHS, which is the department over DCDEE, if they issue a directive that requires the closure and reduced capacity um, to minimize COVID. So pretty straightforward here. So just a quick important note, if your classroom and your or your site meets their criteria that was previously mentioned and must temporarily close and offer remote learning, your site, your program must notify Durham's Partnership for Children immediately. Uh, you would do so by reaching out to Jamika Wells and you'll see at the end of this presentation, I have included her contact information for you. Um, second quick note is that as teachers, um, teacher, per DCDEE, teachers are required to provide remote learning services to children until in-person instruction can resume. So for the entirety of that limited time when you are providing remote instruction, please make sure you are doing so until that child or those children are able to return in in-person instruction. 
Okay. If you do have one of those circumstances um, that was previously outlined, these are the requirements for remote learning. So, of course, we know that the typical pre K day is six and a half hours long, and this consists of, um, excuse me, which includes direct instruction, um, in person instruction, nap time, snacks, transition, child initiated play, outdoor play, all of that fun stuff. So, your remote learning experience for your, your children should be the same. Um, that does not mean that they should be sitting in front of a screen being provided direct instruction for six and a half hours. Um, when operating remotely, your day should be structured accordingly. So your six and a half hour remote learning day should include, um, you know, direct instruction, include time for nap time, for snacks, transitions, everything you see in the second bulleted here. Uh, family-led engagement activities and including those check-ins. So if you're a returning teacher, those family engagement check-ins should sound familiar, hopefully. I'm gonna go over that a little bit later. Um, and as you see in the third bullet, the expectation is that you should be providing short direct instruction and provide activities for children and families to engage in independently that total about six and a half hours of day of the day. Um, so Again, you're not responsible for being in front of a screen with this child for six and a half hours a day, but making sure that you provide enough material for their family. All right, so here are the two different terms that you are going to need to know in regards to remote instruction. You will hear remote moments a lot, and you will also hear family engagement check-ins. Um, remote moments, if you are a newer teacher, these are blocks of live direct remote instruction delivered daily by lead teachers or assistant teachers. So you can see these bulleted requirements below. Um, I have outlined here in this kind of purple color what specific requirements are as far as quantity. So if a remote learning is being provided individually to specific children, so this would be if a child has to quarantine because they have COVID or if they have a household member who has COVID, just, you know, one or two children, you are required to offer remote moments at least once per day for those children. If remote learning is being provided to all children, so if your classroom has to close on the recommendation of the local health department or DHHS, um, you are required to offer remote, remote moments at least twice per day. Um, so the teachers must offer at least two sessions with the same content at different times of day. So one could be in the morning, one's in the afternoon. And this is just to increase families' ability to attend these sessions. And then the last expectation and the requirement is to offer remote moment materials for the families based on that family's needs. Um, I know, so I, I wrote exactly what DCDE included in their document as, as far as reliable access to internet. I know this is uh, logically not possible for all of our, our families and our sites, um, but what this could look like is, you know, offering in their home language, or if you know that they do not have reliable access to the internet, offering paper materials that you can either mail or they are able to pick up. I know that was a really popular option for some of our teachers last year, um, and the families really enjoyed those paper packets as well. So you have a lot of different options to meet those family needs. Next are these family engagement check-ins. So these family child check-ins are opportunities for the lead teacher with the assistant teacher as an optional participant and the family to connect through live two-way communication. Um, so this is, again, during that remote learning if one of those circumstances that have been previously outlined have been met. So these check-ins can take place through, you know, a phone call, a video conference, a socially distanced in-person visit while everyone wears masks. It is intended to be a back and forth conversation in real time, as opposed to, you know, sending emails over the span of a week. So again, you'll see the requirements. The teachers are required to prepare for and document every check-in in writing. Um, a family's or a child's part a family or a child's um, participation in the check-in should be documented and should be used as a means to track attendance. 
Again, in this purple text here, I've outlined the specific require quantity requirements. So again, if you are providing remote learning to individual or like, you know, specific children who are unable to attend in person, you are required to offer a family check-in at least once per week. And if you are providing remote learning to your entire class because your classroom or your site is closed, you are required to offer family check-ins at least twice per week for each family. Um, and again, make every reasonable effort to communicate with the family in an accessible manner. So that would include um, some things such as adjusting the timing of the, the check-in to meet the family's needs, um, attempting to contact the family through multiple formats. So that could be text messages, phone calls, you know, socially visit, socially distanced visit. Um, and then for non-English dominant families, providing communication through an interpreter. So whether that be staff, um, whomever. All right. So and I want to mention really quickly before I go into the teaching strategies remote learning solution. Like I mentioned before, please take a look at the actual document provided by DCDEE. You will see in section 7D that there are some additional recommendations for teachers that I'm not going to walk through, but there are quite a few additional helpful um, resources. They link the North Carolina DPI online pedagogy considerations for digital instruction. They have a whole page that provides guidance on um, protecting students' safety and privacy, um, remote learning resources, things of that nature. So here, um, the teaching strategies remote learning solution. So uh, DCDEE has continued to provide access to the Teaching Strategies Distance Learning resource for all teachers. Um, so what this means is a lot of those features, if you are a returning teacher, a lot of those features that you saw last year, we will have this year. And a lot of them are actually going to be required now. Some of those, um, I'll touch on those updates later. But you can see here in this bulleted list below, um, the what they're calling the distance learning solution. It provides resources. So you'll have 24-7 um, access to the digital curriculum. So all of the curriculum materials, a lot of which we have in our lending library, you will have access to digitally. Um, there are a ton more professional development and uh, webinars, modules in that develop tab that are free that will assist you and pro provide additional guidance for remote learning. Um, of course, you'll have, you know, developmentally appropriate assessment resources and family facing resources. And there is now, of course, that two way communication feature between teachers and families through that My Teaching Strategies Family app. All right, so now I'm going to touch on the teaching strategies requirements per DCDEE. So teachers are required to, when providing remote learning, um, teachers are required to provide teaching strategies, family engagement resources every day to children and their families. Um, of course, this is going off the assumption that you are using teaching strategies or resources for remote learning, that is a requirement. Um, they are also requiring that you highlight opportunities for families to submit evidence of learning remotely through teaching strategies or through other methods. So this could be sharing pictures of completed activities, sharing videos of the child engaging the activity. And this is through that two-way communication feature that we, that I touched on before in within teaching strategies. Um, as far as assessments go, so this is the fourth bullet here that you are required to document child growth and development data in, my, in the My Teaching Strategies platform. So NC Pre-K teachers are allowed to use any formative assessment tool that has been approved by the NC Child Care Commission. Um, our, in Durham, we use teaching strategies. So if you are using, if you would like to, for example, I know it is not uncommon for teachers to want to keep a hard copy and paper copies of a almost a like portfolio for all of their, their children, that's completely fine. However, you are required to document that growth. So that means including your documentation as far as photos, videos, anecdotal notes, et cetera, and complete the quarterly um, ongoing assessments in teaching strategies. Um, the next requirement in regards to teaching strategies is regarding Ready Rosie. 
So this was something new that we, if you are a returning teacher, you know, we kind of dipped our toes into last year. The expectation of DCDEE is that um, teachers are now required. You are going to enroll all of your NC Pre-K families in Ready Rosie and must incorporate Ready Rosie into your existing family engagement plans. So this is to um, support increased engagement and partnership with families. And you will, um, if you are a newer teacher, you'll see that you'll also be watching a, um, a webinar within Teaching Strategies that goes over Ready Rosie. So please don't panic if this is something that's new to you. Um, you know, you'll have the opportunity to learn more about it later on during some rights too. Um, <clears throat> the last bullet on here is regarding the required professional development from DCDEE. So all NC Pre-K lead teachers and teacher assistants will be expected to complete three required training sessions um, with teaching strategies. So these will be related to assessment, responsive planning, and meaningful experiences to support learning. Um, as of this moment, a schedule for these trainings has not been released, but the, it is anticipated to be developed and shared in the next coming weeks. Um, so our agency, Durham's Partnership for Children, we will be working with each of you to make sure that um, you know, we'll should be sharing information about these required training sessions, making sure that these requirements get met and supporting you in this process. All right, and if you still have questions, which of course we understand, we are here to help. So I have included the contact information for um, the most important people that you'll need to reach out to on the pre-K team. So Jamaica Wells, again, that is who you will, either you, your site administrator, will be reaching out to if you, if your site does have a COVID related school closure, um, you know, any of that stuff that will be communicated to Jamaica. Um, you have me, Taylor Young, any TS Gold, Ready Rosie questions, that would be me. Brittany, Gre Brittany Gregory is our director of programs. So um, she can also be a support as well. And then Melissa Rodice Peguero, Peguero sorry, um, is our pre-K program specialist. And so she helps with, um, you know, filling seats, attendance, transfer requests, things of that nature. Um, so you have all of our contact information on the screen here if you have any further questions. Um, so again, this presentation is not comprehensive. I have not gone over the, um, the interim COVID-19 policies document in its entirety. I wanted to hit the high level highlights for you all so that way there was a better understanding of what is expected and what is required of you all as teachers. Um, so if you have any further questions after watching this presentation and reviewing the document, please feel free to reach out either by phone or email and I am happy to help. All right, thank you guys so much. <laughs>